Wow. A clap at the start, that's good. <laughs> so I don't have to sort of keep it a high level. Um, well, I'm excited to be here. This is my second time in Melbourne. Uh, I was here six years ago for some client work in a different organization. And that was my first experience of Melbourne. So I didn't know at all what to expect. But it quickly became like one of my favorite cities. So I was really excited to come back and now been able to spend a week here and sample everything from sort of a high-end fusion restaurant, but still pleased to see there's at least a couple of pie faces uh, still around, because <laughs> that was my abiding memory of last time where I think I ate my body weight in in one day. So <laughs> my Britishness came out. Um, so I'm going to try and make this as interactive as you want it to be. And uh, my, I suppose my challenge to you is that I, when I did this in Sydney, they said, oh, everyone will be too busy drinking their coffee and waking up. I did that a week ago. I said, oh, fine, I'll wax lyrical for 45 minutes then, but we'll see if uh, you want to play, or I'll also be fine if you also want to carry on waking up and drinking your coffee. Um, I'm going to talk from, I suppose, several perspectives and share different ideas that come from, first of all, what we've done to ourselves. So um, you might know some facts about Connie. Uh, you might know a lot about us. Um, the thing that I think is most pertinent to what I'm going to talk about and to what our experience has been is this notion that we call ourselves a 90-year-old startup. Because we, therefore, I think we have great benefits. We have the rich history that often gives stability, that everyone sort of really you know, wants to say, OK, the world is changing, but at least we know we've got this history. This is what we stand for. This is our brand. This is our clients. But since we bought ourselves back from EDS a few years ago, nine, 10 years ago, we've been rebuilding. So we've actually had a little bit of an entrepreneurial culture, almost to sort of bring back some things and reinvent some things. And we've been the beneficiaries of that in learning. That's how I joined with this notion of let's reinvent how we do it. Uh, and that was quite freeing, because not every organization gets a chance to do that. So, um, so I'll share with you what we did as a sort of laboratory on ourselves. Also share with you some insights we get from having conversations with clients about their own journey, and then also about um, many of my peers who are in similar jobs, going through similar things. And there's three things I'm going to um, talk about. Um, all centered around sort of learning. So everybody has a point of view on learning because you're either a professional trying to deliver it or you are a recipient on the glorious receiving end or on the suffering end, depending upon what you think your organization offers. So I'm going to talk about how we equip our organizations better for transformation by, first of all, what we can do differently to help our leaders um, get better at trans leading transformation how the whole of a learning organization can be more focused on transformation, every touch point, and then how learning itself might need to transform because the world is changing, because our learners are changing, um, and also because there's great stuff available and accessible now. So we really have no excuse uh, not to do things differently. So there's some of the threads. Um, this is the invite, just to make sure you are in the right room, and you thought I was going to come and talk about blockchain, given that this is a sort of more variable invite. Uh, I, I can, at some point after we finish, tell you what's it like to be on the receiving end of Trumponomics. I'd be interested to see what we predicted a year ago, but how much of it actually came true. A bit hard to predict, really. A bit hard to predict on a daily basis. So, uh, so these are the three areas. How to develop and guide leaders, how the learning function can be an agency of transformational change, and then how we should transform along with our leaders. So, first of all, let me throw this out. What, why is transformation, why is transformation a word used in business? Why don't we just carry on using change? Like what's, what do you think is different? This will be the first test. It's, it's got a connotation of being much bigger. Bigger, yeah. Yeah. Change implies more little steps, whereas complex transformation. Yeah, yeah. So transformation is sort of bigger, bigger steps. Bolder. Directional. Directional. You're transforming to become something, change into something that might happen. Uh, okay. So that's an interesting one. Actually, I, I, I've not heard that because one, so it's sort of changes are sort of like, you know, you can go in any direction in a circle, but transformation has some idea. W one of the um, pieces that I like is to say that it, that might be the outcome, but often when you start with transformation, it's not sure. It, you know it's going to be big and you know it's, you know it's going to be a sort of bold. But often, you don't know what it is because it's about reinvention, discovery, reimagining the future of a business. Whereas often change, it is a bit more discreet. We can see the steps, you know, once we hit the first one, 
uh, we can plan it out. So it's also, you know, thousands of changes, often interdependent, intersecting, some of them seemingly contradictory in many organizations where, you know, it's hard to make sense of it. So um, the other is, how many of you, let's have a quick show of hands, are either in an organization or a function that's undergoing some form of transformation? So again, it's ubiquitous and pervasive. I mean, it's, it's going on everywhere. Um, and it's hard, therefore, well, one of the things I see is organizations very quickly announce transformation, very quickly come up with a plan, and then very quickly assume the same cast of characters will know how to do it. And they don't give us much time as individual leaders to figure out, well, what do we do differently? Because we've just said transformation is different, but often I find that we just expect that the people who've learned how to sort of manage change will also figure out by osmosis how to lead transformation. And so there's some opportunities there to sort of maybe do it better. Um, it, forever, technology has driven change. But right now, it's just the sheer speed is incredible. I just picked this as one example. Um, so it took 50 years for the car to replace the horse and buggy. In San Francisco, it took less than two years for Uber to replace taxis to the tune of 75%. And then I was chatting with Owen earlier, and you know, Uber will be replaced by autonomous cars, whoever wins that game. And then, I don't know if you saw, it was in the news last week, I think, uh, Google uh, came clean that it was them doing this um, sort of autonomous plane experimentations in Christchurch. It was under the name of another organization. It was them. So eventually, sort of autonomous cars will just be replaced and we won't go anywhere. Everything can be brought to us unless we want human contact and we'll probably figure out how to get that without moving. We'll all become sort of stationary beings. So the, the scale, the, you know, of the speed of this, of how science fiction films become reality in about 20 minutes is incredible. And that's what I think makes leading transformation challenging. Um, so let, uh, Owen mentioned our Global Business Policy Council. They do ongoing sort of thinking and research. And I took a piece of their research. These, they were talking about some of the primary forces of change and uh, started to think about, well, what does that mean for us as leaders? Why does it make it more challenging, more difficult? Because I think that's the problem. A lot of these forces are sort of hitting us every day, and some of them are quite contradictory in terms of what we have to sort of manage and then deliver a different message to our people. So the first is uh, this drumbeat of, they call it strategic uncertainty. I mean, it's uncertainty at any level whatsoever, from you know, countries and governments disappearing regularly uh, to ways of life, to ideas, to policies, to allegiances, to restaurants, to streets. Um, there's just, everything seems fragile. Nothing is sort of impermanence is the word you hear most often. And therefore, you think then about leaders. We have to daily uh, provide empathy to people feeling this, going through it, because we know that's important. But we also have to convey confidence. And sometimes we have to convey confidence even when we're not sure we're confident ourselves. You know, we might be a day ahead. I found out about this yesterday. I had one day to figure out why I can be confident about a path forward and convey it to others. That's a very difficult task. Um, Second, we have incredibly rising stakeholder expectations, again, at every level, whether it's our boards, our bosses, our customers, all demanding more. Um, but also our teams. You know, we want greater empowerment. We want more transparency. Uh, we want more progress more quickly. And again, you know, leaders are going to figure out how to deliver this. And I've got to deliver the right information to help people think this through. And I've still got to be inspirational, even though, again, the bar for it is incredibly high and raises every day. Uh, difficult, difficult tasks. Uh, accelerating decision cycles. I was talking about this actually to um, a client of ours the other day, and it sort of hit me there and then. I, as one example, I have a project my team's working on. So I got back to my hotel at, I don't know, five or six o'clock after this meeting, and then there was a bunch of emails, and then I sat down and answered them. And this team are based a few in Chicago and a few in Dusseldorf. And, I thought, oh, okay, I'll, I'll work for an hour on, the, on what they'd sent and answer them. I can't remember exactly where, the, where they were then, what time it was. I said, great, that'll go now, and I can carry on with the rest of my work for a week. When I woke up, of course, it was their day. They'd worked on it, and then I had three more things. I had to decide, okay, can you approve this? Can you do this? And to me, it was just a small but, again, live example of, you know, 
organizations have this more and more where we're more spread out there's more of an expectation of it's a sort of 24-7 world and we have people working on this 24-7. So we have no thinking time. Or we're not giving ourselves the luxury of thinking time because we're being driven by this sort of world clock. We don't actually plan, think. So despite that, we have to keep up that level of speed so we don't miss the opportunity, but we're still supposed to get rigorous and thoughtful decisions and not just anything. So again, that's not easy. Um, this is a more obvious one. So with all the technical complexity, I've said, great, with all this data, we can do wonderful things. In our organization, we talk about, oh, we can do all this predictive analytics. I mean, we find most days we can barely keep up with how many employees we have. It's sort of, our system is so complicated sometimes, you're trying to figure out, it might be faster just to do a global headcount than to actually like enter the system and try and ask it some questions. So we, we, we've got all these different versions of access to information, but the information is enormous. So how do we provide clarity, but then how do we make sense of it? How do we actually provide meaning to people? And we also know that we don't get time to do this because we're not the gatekeepers. The information goes to everyone because even if we, if we don't give it to them, it'll get there. So we sort of have to provide clarity and meaning whilst everybody is having this information wash over them. Again, maybe a few years ago, you know, we could hold them off while only we had access to the information and we looked at it and we had a week or two and then we announced some wisdom. That world is gone, you know, the information flushes out. Um, increasing organizational interdependencies. Do any of you here have uh, or are on a member of a team that, doesn't, that includes people that don't actually work for your organization? Officially, they're not employees. So there's a few hands. I see that more and more. So this, it's not just interdependencies of functions. Hey, now I'm no longer just in the sales team. There's a team that has sales, marketing, IT, knowledge management. Um, then we see, where, well, it's actually we're a team where there's vendors, and then we have a team where actually they don't work for us, it's contract, or actually it's, it's our competitors and we're doing stuff together. And by the way, I'm on five teams, and I've got each of those flavors. So it's complicated. So we have to be uh, adaptable ourselves as leaders and convey that to our teams. That's a critical skill. But we also have to create belonging, because it's still a basic human uh, desire. And it's not, e it, well, the, the simplest way, and I won't pretend that you were ever guilty of this, but I often used to do it, the simplest way to create belonging was, you know, rah, rah, be on Stephen's team, because Owen's team sucks. <laughs> and sadly, I say sadly, because we can't use that sort of basic device, because three of my team are also on Owen's team. <laughs> you know, it's just, just massive matrix, and it's not even fixed, so it's not as if you can get to know and then sort of figure it out. You've got to try and create belonging with this massive fluidity where I might only be on your team for two weeks. So a big challenge because it's still a big desire of individuals. And the final is rising budgetary pressures. So how can we be both agile and creative to sort of figure out problems and still deliver? And that's a sort of rising drumbeat. But with transformation, uh, it's not just sort of bold change and big moves. It's big and bold expectations of doing more with less. And it gets baked in very quickly in terms of, you know, yes, you're supposed to be doing this with half your team or twice as much. And we can't just run faster, so how do we help our teams? So um, the other day I read an article that talked about the digitization of everything, which can be both positive uh, and scary. Um, positive if we think that, well, it's going to allow us and enable us to do many things and give us time, but you know, that doesn't always get delivered. Uh, none of us might have been around and working like 40 years ago when uh, they had all these adverts out about how they thought the car and that technology and access to petrol uh, was going to free us. And I was laughing because I went to a museum where they showed these adverts. And the adverts were all about we'd have three or four days of leisure and we'd be driving around the countryside in these new vehicles because everyone would have one, we'd all have free time. And you sort of fast forward, well, it's the same. Now we're being told we've got all these great tools in this future digital world, we're all going to have loads of free time. Or it might be the opposite. You know, we might end up with more to do. So um, the critical thing, though, is these skills, that's what this article was saying, on the right-hand side, shouldn't or can't be digitized. So this will actually be worth their weight in gold. This will be the sort of future of, of leadership. All the other things that we might do, you know, planning, resourcing, organization, organizing, analyzing, a lot of these things will be vastly supported or done you know, in some digitized world. But these, most of these, no, we, 
these will be vital, and this is what we've therefore got to make sure our, certainly our leaders are equipped to do in transformation. Now, it's not all bad, because you think, well, why the hell would anyone want to be a leader you know, faced with this? I mean, clearly every day people, people get moved to step up and say, you know, I want to make a change here. There's something inside me that I have a, an idea, I have a vision uh, that resonates with me and my values. And also, I think sometimes we get it wrong when we think people you know, are resistant to change. So, it, you know, they're not. We're resistant to loss, and we love progress. So, you haven't seen this before. It really is about help, helping people think, okay, what is some of the progress in this? And then admit, where are some of the possible areas of loss? Loss of power, loss of status, loss of security. But it's not change itself. There's lots of change and transformation that actually um, could be quite positive. There's lots of it called self-reinforcing that we just do. And many think the smartphone was like that. It was sort of put out there. It seemed like a great idea, and it just took off quickly because it was a positive, good idea. It was self-reinforcing uh, as opposed to this other change that isn't. It doesn't seem to make sense. The best example I heard of this, because clearly then a role of leaders and a role of us in developing leaders is to help them identify those because if you don't put, you put the wrong resource into the easy one, you'll think you're doing brilliantly, where it's actually nothing to do with you. It was the original idea, and you're ignoring the stuff that's actually quite hard. Um, 200, maybe longer than 200 years ago, this happened in surgery, and there were two massive forces that changed surgery, um, anesthetic and antibiotic. So we've all seen films of what surgery was like back then, mostly men dressed in black, sawing people's legs off with screaming, you know, blood baths everywhere. It just looked awful. So these two things happened. Well, the anesthetic was the one that took hold first, even though actually of the two, it was the least important in terms of patient outcomes. And if you think why, why do you think anesthetic took hold faster? Why did all the surgeons, or sore bones, as they might have called, why would that take hold faster as a change without any help? It's, per it's personal. Say more what you mean it's personal. It's well, it matters to the person on the table. Yeah, yeah. Takes away time. What's that? So why does that matter to the surgeon, though? Why would I do it? Stop the screaming. Scre Honestly, that was it. It stopped the screaming and the squirming. So anesthetic, knock them out. I didn't, I didn't do anything differently. I wasn't, you know, I just, I didn't, I didn't have to use one arm to hold them down and three guys to strap them down, and there was no screaming. So I felt better. They still might have died a day later. Antiseptic, antibiotic, took forever because it was all about washing my hands endlessly cleaning the floor, wearing white knot. It required me to do all these changes, and I didn't see antiseptic as um, an instant result. It took 5, 10, 20 years for them to gather data to say, oh, look at patient outcomes. People are living longer if they have this surgery in a room that's clean, that's been you know, had antiseptic. So that's just one example of some change catches, some other doesn't. You've got to figure out what it is. So let's look at then, what could we do then to transform Leaders differently. How do we do this from a development perspective? Um, the basic in this is like, I believe, we have to get leaders to sort of look inside themselves at the same time as looking out at the organization. So I've worked with leaders at all different levels around change. And what I find is um, most of the more senior leaders are looking at the organization. You know, they're not actually thinking that if I'm going to lead a transformation, it might require me to transform myself. And I think that's the crucial difference. I think you can lead change, you know, not quite at arm's length, but you can lead it discreetly and you can do several of them. And it mightn't require you to change because it's defined and it's discreet. But I don't think you can lead transformation and be separate. I think you have to figure out how, how am I going to transform if I want to be credible and I want to be authentic. But too many of our leaders go about this too rationally and too linearly and too intellectually. So the idea I always keep in my own head for this is, um, and I forget who coined it, maybe you'll tell me, that you, f to do this really well, you have to be on the balcony and you have to be on the dance floor. And you have to do this simultaneously. Now, so first of all, you have to have a big picture view of transformation to be on that balcony. But you can't just sort of have a plan that you've never been through. 
I've seen lots of leaders say, okay, I'm on the balcony, and I know I've got a plan of how this will happen. I've got to come up with a brilliant idea, and then I've got to spread this, you know, visually and viscerally. So they know the words, but they've never, they don't feel it because they've not done it for a while. They've not practiced it. They've not tested it with anyone other than their own direct reports or a sort of teed up audience. So part, again, is leading ahead to, well, what do we need to do to develop leaders? We've got to give them more of these opportunities to practice and try on some of this and not just intellectually say, yes, yeah, step one, I'm going to spread an idea. And then, of course, they've got to figure out how am I going to um, shift ownership. I worked with a, an organization in Canada. They had this in the plan. They're like, yes, yeah, step two, we're going to sort of get out there and really help others understand so they can lead it. And it was only by accident that they found out they were rubbish at it. The CEO said, um, when we go through this day, Stephen, let's do some of the training you, we're going to do for some of the supervisors. So we gave them this little exercise, which was just called Hot Cards. You pulled out a character, and you had to assume you'd met that character walking across the car park, and that character asked you the question. And so the CEO drew one, and it said, oh, it was Frank from the warehouse. Why does this merger make sense for the warehouse guys? And the CEO was goddamn awful. I mean, he gave the worst answer. And the only thing that saved the day for him was 10 minutes later, the CFO was even worse at it. <laughs> so he was able to laugh and recover. But he realized, he said, you know, we just intellectualize this whole thing as a sort of distant plan. We're, we're not actually aware of, one, how hard it is sometimes to be believable in some of these conversations. And, and how much human emotion there is in going from step one to step two. You know, we talk about tick, let's find out what's in it for them. Great. And then when we've done that, we'll do this. Without really sort of having the sense of this is a hugely important and a hugely difficult, complicated and sometimes lengthy task. It's not just one line in a change plan. So the critical part then is this, how can I figure out how to transform myself? So my belief is that if you're going to try and transform a thousand people, you have to know how to transform one, and the first one has to be you. And it can't be the big picture until you've got the sort of the micro of, how can I convince one person to go about this? Um, because at this point, you can't inspire and develop and transform others unless you know what it feels like to do it yourself, on yourself, because then you've really got a sort of shared human experience around this, not an intellectual one. So when we wanted to do this to ourselves, we then had to think about, well, how are we going to go about this differently? And we had this brilliant insight given to us by one of our most senior leaders. So about five years ago, we decided we were going to transform a lot of our approach to running our organization. And then we had this great quote from a partner in France that uh, our senior leaders hate to be taught but love to learn. And therefore, we knew that the answer to, well, how are we going to transform our leaders and we need to sort of get things in them had to be experiential and immersive learning. It couldn't be teaching. But when we, I looked around the world, and this is the same in most of our clients, I'd be interested if you have this, most of our leadership training or leadership development or leadership transformation is a, a day, day and a bit, because everyone's really busy. It's uh, some clever person comes in, does a speech, a few questions so we can show that we're also clever, and a few notes, and then we clap and then we leave. In fact, one of the other person said, yeah, it's a clever fest. And we all keep our suits of armor on. No flipping emotion here, please. No, thank you. And, and, and if we're really clever, we wear three suits of armor so we can play the game of being, pretending to be vulnerable. I'll take my first suit of armor off, but I've still got two more just in case. And that usually survives a day because we're never going to get deep enough in a day or even in two days. Um, we are also global. Um, so the thing that we notice is the first third of any interaction, everybody was still thinking about what they'd just done, or they were just exhausted from the flight. And even if it's, they're all local, they're all coming thinking, oh, you know, I'm in the right building. Uh, what about that crappy email I just got from the finance department? Did I leave the iron on in my room? So you sort of realize that the first few hours, first day of anything like this, sort of are often wasted. And then the last piece, day, half day, they're thinking about going back. They're either worrying, thinking, shit, I've got a million emails, all these projects to face, or I've got a long flight. So the other insight we had about it was that if we're going to do immersive learning, if we're going to do this seriously and say, the outcome of this will be leaders better prepared completely to lead transformation, not better aware of the intellectual steps of transformation, that they can't be flybys. Because you just lose a lot of time, and you get very little time to really get leaders to open up to think about themselves. That takes a while. And the more senior we are, often the longer it takes for us to sort of truly open up 
hold up a mirror to ourselves, hold up, help hold up a mirror to others, and try to figure out what am I really good at and how can I do more of this, and what other experiences are showing me some possible vulnerabilities, and then how can I be honest about it. So, does this resonate in, in your organizations? Is this a little bit like some of the learning you have? Um, when, on my visits to Australia in the past, I've actually found amazing examples of immersive learning. So there's a lot, a lot of, um, I think, great stuff. Even our own organization emerged from some experiments here. Um, but I think a little bit like, certainly the US is totally like this, has the best and the worst of everything. You know, so there are some pockets of amazing immersive training, and then there's also lots of pockets of 17 white binders, you know, detailing out every minute of every day of a program. So let me give you some of the, uh, we sort of think about what are the ingredients that might make this work? What, what on earth does immersive learning look like? And I'm, I've used real pictures, because if you want, I can tell you some sort of real stories behind what we did. But there was sort of more to show this was a map or a path. So the, um, Owen mentioned this. So the first thing we said, we wanted to base this on not just a sort of uh, general development plan. And we, came, we shared, partnered with London Business School, this great professor, if you ever look him up, he's got some hilarious videos called Dan Cable. And he's a big proponent of this notion called best self. So it's not just strengths. Um, best self is this notion of when our values and our strengths and our purpose comes together and we do something really important. Uh, linked to, there's a quote by the guy Joseph Campbell who, who wrote a book called Follow Your Bliss, but later on in life said that was a terrible quote. I should have called it Follow Your Blisters. Because when we're at our best self, we're doing hard things sometimes. It's not easy, it's not sort of nirvana. So best self really is about um, helping us understand that high bar for each of us. And of course then we ask the question, I think I did that last Tuesday. It was raining, I remember I went into the office and I gave the feedback and it felt good to do it even though I was terrified of the reaction. And then you ask yourself, so why didn't I do that on Monday? And what was I doing yesterday? So of course we, we have to have the troughs, otherwise there's no peaks. But it's trying to say, okay, how can I focus on what are these troughs and how can, what can I do to do more of them rather than dwelling too long in the troughs? You can't ignore them, but it's about how can I have more of my best. So we made the whole process this. So you, know, you get lots of inputs, lots of mirrors, lots of self-reflection. Um, we went back and actually said no sort of electronic system. We tried to get everyone to reach out to 10 people who knows them. And everybody had to write a letter and say, uh, where have you seen Fred at his best? Where have you seen Jane at her best? Can you write the story? And then we just collated them and gave them to people and gave them coffee and said, go for a walk and read them. Which was good because people came back quite moved. I mean, some got family members said, no, first time my brother's strung a sentence you know, longer than three words at me. And, lots of and then they start to ask God, why have I never asked? And why have we never had this conversation before? And then, of course, you turn it on yourself. And have I ever written anything like this to anybody that would move them? So let's start doing more. Here's me at my best. Um, the cohort is a powerful force. So we, we believe you, you need to have uniquely personal journeys. So we, we introduce you know, coaching and journaling and reflection because we're all different. But to really push this notion of uh, we're not teaching, you couldn't have one person at the front saying, oh, you say we're not teaching, but there's someone at the front. So you can use the cohort to sort of say, well, we're all experts. We've all got experiences. We've all got observations of each other. And how can we get the cohort to coach, to cajole, to support, to challenge, to hold the mirror up? Uh, to clap, to cry together. And, and it's this critical thing that makes a difference. They're shared experiences, not just shared language. So I see many organizations go for shared language, which is terrific. You have to have shared language so that we can move quickly. But if you know this from biology, you know, shared language is in a part of our brain that works pretty quickly. But shared experiences is our limbic system that works hundreds of times faster. So if you use a word, that is linked to a shared experience, everybody gets it and resonates and moves dramatically quicker. And we've seen it quite powerful in molding behavior of some of our you know, senior partners about how can they you know, collaborate across continents. They all want to, and intellectually the word was there, and we can come up with phrases for it, essential rightness. Tom Carney wrote about it you know, 80 years ago. But it was only getting this sort of gut thing where they were in it together it made a massive difference. Um, we do exploration. So if you want to say we're going to generate curiosity, you have to let them explore and play. Um, there's a museum in Philadelphia called the Please Touch Museum. And I've always loved that concept. Because as, as a kid, I always remember going around museums and getting your hand slapped, don't touch. 
this, the whole thing is like they've designed it so the things are robust enough and they tell the kids, no, touch them, grab them, play with them. So we said, well, that's when we learn the most when we're children and yet when we get to adults, we want to learn and yet we say, no, sit down and listen to someone. So we made it um, touch and here, one example of a string quartet. How to learn how to be a self-managed team instead of learning about it, literally getting in among a string quartet and listening to what they did and then talking to them to figure out how do they go from being individual performers to producing something amazing. Um, and the other thing we did is we don't tell people what we're going to do. You know, because we, we tried very hard to say, if we're trying to develop ambiguity and creativity, we have to get rid of the typical uh, minute by minute training timetables. And these are small things, but you realize, God, yeah, why do we do that? You know, it's because we all want to have that expertise. I know what's coming next. You know, I can relax. And so I said, well, we don't know what's coming next in life. Transformation is hard. So let's start in the learning room. Say, yeah, you don't know what's coming next, but we'll, we'll build enough trust so that you trust us to say, we're not going to put you in danger, but we're not going to tell you. We're going to give you, it's in this room and it's roughly this theme and see if that can get even more magic to happen. Um, we talk about the whole person, I've talked about that, getting rid of your suits of armor, getting rid of your mask, so that we can really understand you know, emotions, uh, physical, relational, not just intellectual. Um, we uh, try to drive creativity and adaptability. We use photography sometimes as different ways, you know, to get people to tell stories, uh, to get out there, to sort of see what, what story you can tell using the same photograph, similar situation. Um, and then the last is feedback. We use each other, we don't just use horses. Um, but we, um, first of all, tried to sort of make feedback ubiquitous uh, before we got to sort of any sort of fancy mechanisms. It's often we talk about feedback and we say, yes, it's really essential. But I don't think we really like it. Um, I saw a great T-shirt. I actually tried to chase after this guy in, I think it was in Johannesburg Airport, because <laughs> I wanted to see like where it came from. The front of his T-shirt said, everybody loves feedback. And the back of his T-shirt said, until someone spills some on you. And I just love that because I find, I'm, yeah, no, feedback's great, feedback's great. And then my boss says, oh, Stephen, I've got some feedback for you. Oh, <laughs> you know, and then you sort of tighten it a little bit and wonder what the hell is he going to say? So we need to make it sort of more regular. So we got into this habit every morning and every evening, just having quick chats. We send them on walks because when you move, it feels less threatening. You know, I'm not just looking in your eye saying, here it is. Move with someone. And we came up with this sort of best model. I have a few observations and here's the impact it had on me. And we did this every day. And now for our new, new starters, we, we sort of say, look, this is part of our world. Uh, we've been here an hour, give each other feedback. And they're all like, what do you mean? We've, we don't know each other. They said, well, you've had an hour's interaction. Give each other the feedback and the gift of how did you show up? And then you say, well, I didn't notice them. I said, well, that's the feedback. Maybe they haven't shown up yet. Maybe, you know, maybe they haven't spoken. I said, it's not, you're not putting a judgment on it. It's an observation. I put an observation that I haven't heard you speak in the first hour, and here's how it made me feel. What it means, that's for a conversation. And it's trying to sort of do loads of that. So our programs have to be laboratories for the cultures we're trying to create. So that's the other thing I find with intellectual-based programs where we teach something. Often they're divorced from the vision and values of the organization. Whereas when you do experiential learning, it's easy to say, you know, we're about creating customer intimacy. Well, what does that look like in a learning session? It shouldn't be, well, just because we're learning IT skills, how do we create intimacy? We should be doing it here. Because if we can't do it in the learning room, then what chance have we got to do it under pressure when it's customers, when it's clients, when it's real? So we have it with leaders. I don't know if you ever had this, the leaders getting in a circle talking about the bloody organization. And you sort of ask them, well, who the hell are you? You know, and I had this with a CEO and his or her direct reports. Well, you know, if only the organization would do this, it's like, well, oh, I'm in the wrong room. I must be the grown-ups or somewhere else. It's sort of how, make yourself the agency right now. So we have that as another. If we want more feedback, we can't just say they should do more feedback. Let's do it here. If we want more honesty, let's do it here. We're here together for a day. What would that look like transformed? And let's see if we can reach it. Then we have a high bar, and then we have more of a mandate to say, okay, I can try and encourage others. Whereas if we can't even do it in learning, then it feels a bit hollow to go outside the room and proselytize, let's do more of this. So these are our ingredients that we started to pull together. We went first with our most senior people. Oops. And with London Business School, we developed this program called Expanding Horizons. Now, because we're global, we did it in quite a large scale because the cost of travel is enormous. So we, we thought about three or four modules over 12 months. 
And in the end, we decided actually to sort of collapse the first two or three into one. So we did nine days and six days because trying to do four day modules, the cost of the flight, people landing, being jet lagged for the first day. So we collapsed, but that was revolutionary. I mean, senior partners saying, I can be out of the marketplace for nine days, but if you plan and we told our clients, and it was great. I suppose there's that fear of, I'm important, I need to matter, I'll be missed, and you will be missed. But also, we all need to develop, and we all need to make this sort of deep investment in ourselves. And um, we've put over 200 of our partners through this program. We did different places. We did London, and we did India. And we had a story behind it. We said, London, we were going to give them these incredibly different experiences. And we said it was about um, reigniting your love of food, to use an analogy. We're going to have some great chefs and some weird tastes and throw them on your tongue. But we're going to do it in a normal place, so not everything is rocking. London, normal city, I know that. But all these weird tastes, love of food. And then we went to India, and we said India is going to just challenge you every minute of the day with paradoxes, but we're not going to give you hardly any other inputs, because now you're the chefs, and you have to cook for each other uh, one day, literally. But sort of, again, as an analogy, because that's more like life. You're the leaders. So you have to be able to do this and sustain this whilst being hit with all these other uh, sensory issues. Uh, so that was you know, so part of our, of our design for this. And then we used it to think about how would we transform all of our learning. Because once it worked as an experiment for our most senior people, then we thought, okay, then we have license to do it elsewhere. And that's, that's another thought, that's sort of a new thing for me. Often we've picked pilot groups, cross-sectional groups, more junior groups, high potential groups to sort of prove a new learning leadership development approach. This was the highest risk. If this had failed for our most senior partners, we'd have not gone anywhere. But we had to get them on board because then they became the role models and the mentors and the coaches. It would have been easy and very powerful to do this four layers down, and, but we'd have still then had to sort of fight up and down. Here, we started to enroll and we asked each group of partners do you want to enroll in the next group? It's your money. Or would you rather put it in the bonus pool or put it somewhere else? And each group enrolled the next. And then we designed our whole curriculum. So I'll pause these any questions and I'll do some questions at the end. Sorry, I know I've been... Um, did I see any? Can you uh, indirectly Right. Right. So how do you kind of balance the focus and need to drive cost? Right. But for transferring the organization, it's all about process, behavior, leadership, in a really, really, once upon a time you talk five years, now you kind of talk three years, but I think it's a lot less than three years. Yep. So it's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. There's a couple of thoughts I have. It's one, um, even if you don't think you're going through transformation now, or there's a seeming pause, this is the new normal, so we should be equipping all the time, all leaders to be able to do this all the time as the core skill. And, and that's why I think it's now, all leadership development needs to be built around, how can I manage this big picture plan and be on the dance floor, and have some abilities around those other core skills. Because you're right, you can't wait till it gets announced, because then, the sort of, sometimes the sprint starts. Um, but secondly, there's got to be something, because again, and I'm saying it's just a choice. I'm not saying like organizations feel they have this choice, but they do, to say, okay, we're about to do this massive transformation. We've got to give ourselves some time to not just get ready with the content, but to get ready with the leadership transformation part of it. It doesn't mean you've got like 16 days. I mean, our, our program you know, was planned over several years, but it's about what would we do that would be different than what we'd normally do. So let's give ourselves, so if your normal is a day and it's a long business agenda, and then we do a quarter day on a leadership topic, well then figure out how can we expand that a, a bit more, and how can we make it experiential not being talked at. Um, so I did one with an organization in, um, in the US where they were going through very tough times, and they were, they were gonna have an offsite to figure out how bad are we? You know, they wanted to really get a level of, look, we gotta tell ourselves the truth, so they had a sort of day on that. And then they were going to do a day on planning, a day on communication, and we just persuaded them to say, well, if nothing else, in the middle, 
do a day on how do you feel? And therefore, how might you persuade one person to even though you've now been honest, that they're not saying thank you for that honesty, this is terrible, I'm off. Honest, but there's a glimmer here of the way forward. And so we just did some very simple and some very inexpensive things. We were in a crappy hotel. And actually they would joke that we went to Disney but didn't see Mickey. We were in Orlando in a, a Marriott courtyard basement windowless room for whatever reason. But I said, well, that's the first section. Let's go walk around the car park and be in sunlight when we have some of these. So we just did simple things and it, it turned them into realizing the, the value for them and the gift that they weren't, make, they weren't giving themselves a chance at even feeling uh, some of these things to be able to be better. Um, so they were there too, but um, yeah, it's not easy because it's sort of, if the senior team doesn't do it, who know it's coming, then it's harder for everybody else. So that very senior team has got to build into their plan. You know, when they work with people like us, <laughs> we've just done this massive thing, we're gonna say yes to it. Part of the first phase has to be the transformation, not just the digitization, you know, the sort of transformational skills. So I think you're talking about how, you're talking about a sustainable transformation. Most of the transformations around are cost-driven. Right. And they're happening very quickly, and they're disengaging with people, customers, from what I see. Right. Right. From A to B. Right. And sustain you in B so you don't have to come back in another yep. time and do it all over again. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're right. Now, not every industry, some of their transformations are not just cost, they're complete reinvention. But even the cost ones, and I've had this conversation with learning people to say, look, I've worked in many organizations where there's a big change, and what happens as a result, I have half the budget. But then it's like, and I'll come on to think, talk about this next then. That the worst thing you can do is to say, I'm now running 50%, I've got a half budget. You have to start again. You have to say, I haven't got nothing. What would I do if I started from scratch with $3 million instead of $6 million? If you're always mentally, and that's not easy to do, then everything you do will feel subpar and it'll feel like you're spreading peanut butter out where it's barely visible on the bread. So that's why then it's about going back and thinking, okay, where am I gonna pick the things to do. And of course, learning has more tools accessible now uh, with online and virtual learning that are more powerful that actually enables us to do different things with scale. And I find lots of organizations are wasting face-to-face -face classroom time teaching fairly basic skills that can be done differently. So there's more flexibility. So from a learning perspective, it's that mindset shift. I've got three million, start at zero, what would I do? And then to try to think through, I can't do everything, what are, my, what are my high spots? I'll be the first to admit that we learned lots of lessons about what didn't work as well as we thought. Uh, in the end, we had a choice. So in our situation, our leadership is quite spread out, 330 partners with a very small executive team and a board, and racing like mad post the EDS buyout to you know, get the firm back. So we wanted to knit them all together, so we made these global cohorts. So it really did give this great feeling of one partnership, but it meant that you would go back to your local office and you might be the only one. And so the cohorts adored each other. You know, they were in touch. They're still on uh, WhatsApp groups. They see each other because they've got this shared experience. In hindsight, we didn't do enough actually to knit together the constituents back in the office. And I started doing it probably two years into the implementation. I started running refresher events, not with a cohort, but I'd go to the M Munich office and say, let's get eight, the eight of you that have been on the program. And I would just get them to share what they were applying, what was working, what wasn't working. And I'd have done that faster, because yeah. I realized that the cohort, so when we have a global partner meeting, it's an, an, all we have to do is talk about some of these things, there's an amazing feeling, but some of them find it harder to apply in their own locales because we didn't do enough. Um, so. so developing a strategy to ensure that there's a peer-to-peer -peer sharing network yeah. set up you know, in, in many ways that people can go yeah. share. Across the groups, so not within the cohorts, we had all that. We should have spread more, more throughout uh, to make it, you know, had more structure yeah. to have, the, uh, have more of those sort of alumni sessions. Um, and there was a it, few. Because it's almost like embedding it into the BAU rigor. So it's like, yeah. Yeah. Transformation, our insights, how we're developing ourselves. 
Yeah, and now we have it. So part of my trip here, I, I did a couple of sessions here, and it was funny. You know, I go to different offices, and I never know what to expect in terms of does the shared language equal the shared experience? It just took here a little bit because there was a load of them that had all been in different cohorts, and we were able to quickly get into, you know, how to be a better team because we had a depth of language of we weren't just talking superficially, and there was a language of best self. Um, and so now we've, we've also embedded some of these into our HR systems. So inside our performance management system is you know, gradually spreading this notion of best self. We ask questions about it. So we want it to show up more of the time. I'll show you one other quick slide. I know I'm not, um, I can talk, oh, it's this. Um, I, I did an audit of our learning and I sat back afterwards and I have several people on my team who are consultants, so they, they turned it into, you know, said, Stephen, look, it's fascinating. We tend to look at learning through this lens of strategy. Here's the strategy of the organization. Are, is learning delivering? And then we become a little bit of a gap analysis fulfillment department. We wait to be told, here are the critical skills, or we investigate them and we teach them. In our organization, and I've seen several clients like this, they said, you know, we don't eat lunch together. We have teleworking, flex working, or, or, we're, or we're getting rid of our offices and asking people to work from home because it's cheaper. So the only time we actually see each other and have a real conversation that's not just a business agenda is learning. So I said, well, therefore, learning should be this forum. We should be talking about the transformation in learning. Everything about learning should mirror the best of the organization and what we're trying to achieve. So strategy is one bucket, but then we sort of said, what about employee value proposition? You know, does anyone join your organizations because of learning? And the question is, well, why not? You know, the people have got a choice now in certain situations, and we all know we're going to need to learn because in three years, my job might disappear. In 10 years, our industry might disappear. And people are getting wise to this a little bit now. Not, not in, and it varies country by country, but we're getting a sense of, yeah, I'm here for like 40, 50 years of work. I better sort of keep my skills up because I look at our finance department and they, we didn't push them to keep their skills up because we have a legacy system. And now we're sort of buying something different and half of them aren't ready. And it's like, well, whose fault is that? So it's think about, you can't offer everything. And people have a high bar. You know, my 17-year-old daughter's already done Myers-Briggs. I'm like, crikey, that used to be my core tool to impress people. So, so we got to, it's a high bar, you can't do everything, pick your moments. So we said to our team, what do we want to be known for? And therefore, why would people join us versus joining there? And that became a critical one. Culture and brand, I talked a little bit about that. I, I go around and say, um, and I won't name who I've been teaching this week, which clients, but it's like the culture and brand driven too much by the hotel we're in, uh, or by whichever sort of building services manager is in, ends up being in charge of the floor. And you sort of walk in and everyone's got lanyards that say something about their vision, creating brilliant connections. And then the room just looks bloody awful. We had the same. And we want to be the most admired organization. And we'd get all these new joiners and we put them in the Novo Hotel at O'Hare Airport. You could see Chicago. Couldn't go there, though. <laughs> and, by, and, and, that, and we'd say, and you were lucky. You have windows. So it's, we, we hire these amazing people. And therefore, how can we reflect our own culture and brand and it's, again, small things. Take control. Like, I don't use hotels anymore that uh, aren't flexible on breaks, um, which is hard in some countries. You know, we tried to do an event in France. They like, went so mad that we had to have pastries at 10.30. Well, like, no, the whole first hour and a half is on wellness. <laughs> We're not having pastries, but it's being you know, stubborn about, I don't want tables. The fight you have in certain organizations to get rid of the table because I want to sit in a circle and see each other. How can we talk to each other if the whole conversation is me trying to look down a sort of long rectangular table? And these are little things, but so many learning organizations feel disempowered to do anything about them. It's like, so start, what can be done differently? Um, the user experience. There's a massive opportunity with online learning. But there's this concept called Sunday Monday. I don't know if you've ever come across it. You know, Sunday, I'm playing Clash of Clans, and I'm ordering something on Amazon at 9 AM, and it gets delivered by 6 PM. Amazing. And then Monday, I go in, and corporate training gives me, I mean, black and white television. You know, here's an ethics video, or a webinar that's basically a turgid deck with the most boring speaker in the world. So I'm not ever thinking we'll get as good as the stuff we offer to our customers, because we have whole departments working on that. But we shouldn't be offering the rubbish we've been offering over the last five, six years of e-learning, which most people think is pretty dreadful. Because now all the tools have become accessible. You know the drawing hand artists? Have you all seen those videos where it's a drawing hand? So I did those for a client five years ago, custom ones for a series of interventions and change models. It cost us $25,000. 
Now, it's 80% as good. You can buy the app for $500 and type in your own words, and the hand does them. And stuff like that. So we've got no excuse. All these tools are becoming available to, so that we can make the user experience better. And then think of the user experience of how you show up for things. You know, we used to have letters that say, hey, welcome to Empowerment 101. But the letter then gave you all the rules of joining and signing and expensing and travel and no, you can't fly this class. And it was like, so we're saying the class is empowerment, but the user experience is actually reading a letter that says you're pretty disempowered, really. So why would I go to the class? So again, it's like looking at, you know, as if that run it like a business, not as a business. Lots of learning organizations run it as a business and waste their time on stupid financial accounting. But it's like run it like a business. They're your real customers. And they should, you should view them, they have a choice not to use your entire learning department, but to go somewhere else. And there's lots, there are lots of companies that would offer that something else as well. Um, and then the final is for the talent management, the future. This goes back to this other point about um, how do you, who asks the question and who's responsible for how do I get better and get better prepared for the skills I'll need in three years, in five years? And I don't think we know the answer, but we've got to keep asking it because if no one asks it, I mean, I, I saw a presentation a while ago that said whole countries will fall off a cliff. Is anyone here from Belgium? Okay, so I can share the example that this person gave. It was like, if Belgium was a business, they'd be forced to merge with Holland or get taken over by France. <laughs> They've got a fleeing of talent and a fleeing of industry. And, and people are sort of clinging to the rock of, they're doing the same things they've done for the last 20 years. And businesses don't think they've got a choice, so businesses are leaving. So suddenly it's like, okay, what are we going to do if you're still there in Belgium and you need this new skill and the government's not doing anything and they aren't available? So what, you're just going to leave? So we have to think about these questions. And it's, it's not easy because we don't know what people will need in three years, but we've got to create this sort of model of agile learning. So we, we began with this. I'll show this one final slide that we use. We've just started it, actually. So many in our room mightn't, um, mightn't have seen it yet. Lots of organizations have a model for learning and for individual development. But often, or too often, it, um, it gets buried in the section of your learning called individual development. It gets hidden in uh, individual development, something for you, mindfulness, cat videos. It's not core. This should be the core now. The first thing you should learn that I would teach on day one, if they didn't know it, is how to learn and how to grow and how to manage your own career. Because then, we're going to give you amazing resources because there's stuff available now. So there might be you know, the 17 million learning assets out there of which 16 and a half million are free. But of course, you know, you, some, don't, some worry you can't just use the wisdom of the crowd because you might get crap. But we can't control it anymore. So we therefore, yes, we can control by having great examples of pathways and learning artifacts. This is good, therefore you know this is bad. But the better way is to make even more informed buyers. So helping people think through, well, what do I love? Am I really clear on my passions, my purpose, my values? Secondly, do I know what my best self looks like? And do I realize I have to amplify my best self and increase it? I can't say after three years, my best self is I'm a brilliant analyst. That's great for now. You have to be a serial master. What's your next gig going to be? And it might be something adjacent and join. It might be completely different. How do you keep pushing that? And then finally, opportunities and needs. How can I take control of that with brand, network, and great work, as opposed to passively waiting for the organization? Organizations have a role for each of these, but we have to get individuals to be totally equipped to drive them. And again, that's different, I see, in different countries. Uh, in America, it's a bit more prevalent as a need, not there as a skill. That's because America's had a history of you're a worker at will, and we can fire you in two weeks, and so we don't trust our employers. But we're no more skilled at it. We're just sort of told to do it. Other countries, there's still this paternalistic sense where we're not even thinking enough about this. So we need to sort of make this almost the gateway to all learning and all career so that I can access the millions of artifacts and so that I can also at least be ready to ask the questions myself. What more do I need? What's next? So any other questions? Sorry, I've bounced around a little bit at the end, but... I'll. Oh, that's yeah. What's yeah. the name of the app with the hand writing? I'll. I actually have business card sitting to get one of those. Guys. Uh, so I'll. I'll get it for you. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't remember it offhand. Yeah. There are. Um, 
There are some brilliant resources now. I mean, that's the thing. I think it's a scary, but a hugely um, exciting time to be in learning because, scary because you should do more, but now all this stuff is available. So we can do massive scale training that's really good with connected classrooms, with all these things. You know, stringing together the TED Talk, the Khan Academy piece, which are free, and then <coughs> your own custom introduction linked to maybe a live class. That, we could, that years, four years ago they were rubbish, they weren't available. Um, so it's how can we then get our own functions churned this way and how can we as internal customers of it, you know, sort of demand it more. But I'll, I'll, if you wait at the end or I'll get your name and email it to you. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, Robert? I'll try and find a question in here somewhere. Um, oh, so you have a speech, Robert? Or that's I'm, a trying <laughs> to, I'm trying to figure out exactly what it is. Um, from an IQ point of view, I think we all know there's things that we're good at and things that we're bad at. And we push our careers naturally to skills that we have that, that align with the role. Mm -hmm. and, and intellectually, you can do tests and measure yourself, am I good or bad? Right. You, one of the first things you put up were those six things forced in change, and there were 12 capabilities. Most of those were on the EQ side of things, they were emotions. Yeah, yeah. And I think every leader probably goes, no, I'm good at all those. <laughs> or I can learn them. Two questions. Can you learn all of those 12 things? Right. And can you measure where you are on a continuum to know whether I am going to be a good leader or whether I actually have to <laughs> get somebody else to give me, to augment some of that stuff because there's things I just can't right. learn to be good enough. It's a good, it's a good question. Uh, I had this conversation yesterday with, or the day before with a group of leaders, uh, one of our clients, because um, one of them was an engineer and he wanted a benchmark and he wanted to know, how do I know if I'm any good at these things? It made me smile. I said, welcome to my organization who want to benchmark and measure uh, everything. Is it going to come back, guys? We'll get the list for you. Um, the the answer is all of the above. You can't completely um, teach and learn all of these. That's why we use experiences. Half of experiential learning is drawing out memories that actually you are better than this that you think because we start out in life with a lot of these skills. You know, kids are very agile, adaptable, and we get rid of them as we focus on intellectual pursuits as adults, and especially as leaders. So sometimes it's reminding yourself that, actually, I do have some natural empathy. If I just listen and calm down a bit and stop trying to think, shit, I'm the leader, I better have the answer. No, listen, which, you know, I used to be able to do. So some of it is reminding, and some of it is giving you a sort of safety net experience to hold a mirror up to yourself and say, actually, yeah, in the back of my head somewhere, I realize I'm not good at creating belonging. I, I, I like to join, but I've never done that. So therefore, what are the one or two that I can practice? And then you can, you can get, but you need the sort of, I think for leaders, an emotional experience. It's not just the feedback tool. I've worked with so many leaders who get a feedback tool of these. And it still doesn't sink in, even when their whole team says they're poor at this. They sort of then selectively remember, well, I was deliberately focusing on something else. So that's why I think the sort of experiences are more powerful. And some organizations, you know, try to hire. That's not easy either, because of course we show up and we're at our, you know, EQ best. But many organizations still aren't even looking for these. We, we still have quite an old-fashioned search mechanism that goes, that's based on experiences and the sort of intellectual chunks of our resume. Um, I, I, we all get asked that question, sadly still, what are your development areas? And, and I don't know why we ask it, because are we trying to show that, oh, I can be vulnerable, I'll share a few development areas. It's a sort of weird question. It's been around for 20 years. The most powerful one I've heard lately is, um, what's your purpose? What, you know, what do you stand for? What's your intent? And then that throws a lot of people, because that requires some introspection and some emotional depth, and the answers can be quite freeing. So even some of the hiring for this talent I think we can think differently. So, but good question. It's not a, the key is the intent of knowing that's the question and figuring out that the way we do it is probably not working. So, well look, I'll say thank you now so you can grab more coffee or, or go about your days. And hopefully I've provoked something in your heads rattling around and uh, thank you for coming. Good.